What's interesting about doing research on police militarization and police behavior is that we have these stories, unfortunately, every day about police violence. And I was just thinking about the story of Daniel Shaver, the young man from Mesa um, who was shot by an uh, officer in a hotel room and they had body camera video. And that officer had an AR-15, which is a military style weapon, and he had body armor. And you could just see in that video how aggressive, how almost, that the officer wanted to kill him. And in that video, and so, you know, it's, you know, I look at my research, I do my research, I get academic, but there's also the story part of it, the anecdote part that I try to tie together. My name is Dr. Benga Agilori. I'm an associate professor of economics at the University of Toledo. One thing that we see a lot of in terms of the relationship between racial and ethnic composition of uh, counties and the militarization of police is that there's a positive relationship, that cities that have more diverse, I really don't want to use the word diverse, but more ethnically fragmented um, communities tend to have larger uh, acquisition of uh, military, uh, military items. So in terms of studies of police militarization, one of the largest problems is the actual data that you can get in terms of militarization. And so we've heard a lot about militarization because this basically came out of the Ferguson protests in August 2014, and everyone heard about this new program called the 1033 program from the Pentagon. So the 1033 program was started in 1989, but really kind of built up in uh, 1997 and then 2006 is when agencies really start to acquire surplus items. So what the military does is when they have excess surplus items, they go through the Pentagon to allow local law enforcement agencies to acquire this at very minimal cost. So since the Ferguson protest, we've kind of had a visual uh, impact, we saw the visual impact of militarization. So there was data available from that, but the problem with police militarization is that it's much larger. And so when you think about police militarization, there's kind of four dimensions that we can look at. Material, cultural, organizational, and operational. And so material is the actual item, so we think about the 1033 program. When we talk about cultural, we talk about language, so the war on drugs, the war on terror, that kind of language that's used by the police when it's actually used by the, should be used by the military. When we think about operational, we think about no-knock raids, actual military-type tactics that are used by local law enforcement agencies. And then finally, organizational is when militarization is actually normalized through having SWAT teams, uh, drug task force, terrorism units. So within agencies, you have military-type organization. So when we think about militarization, impact of militarization on communities, we have to look at all four dimensions. And when we talk about the 1033 program, we're narrowing our kind of focus on one aspect when there's so many more aspects. And so that's one of the problems with kind of doing the research on militarization. We just don't have enough on the other dimensions of militarization. And then the other problem with um, studying militarization, especially when we talk about the 1033 program, is that while we have information about what they acquire, we don't know how they use it. So you, you say, okay, well they acquire, say, you know, five tanks, but do they use them in parades? Do they actually use them to on SWAT raids? We don't know that. So when we talk about the relationship between militarization and say excessive use of force, lethal force, we don't, we can say this kind of relationship, but we can't say for certain that this is actually how it's being used. And so that's where qualitative study, kind of doing ethnographic studies, that's where that kind of research would be helpful. And hopefully in the future, we'll see more of that. So some of the preliminary work I've looked at is kind of relationship between the acquisition of surplus and lethal use of force, so fatal police encounters. And so some of the relationships that I do find is that there actually is a positive relationship that we see that acquisition of more of these items lead to more fatal police encounters. Now in terms of the quantity of fatal police encounters, and this has been more, it's really difficult because we really don't have good data on police violence. And so, you know, can we say there's more violence now than there was, say, in the 60s? I, I don't know. But there is a positive relationship, and I think a lot of it goes into back into that discussion of the dimensions, so that you have the acquisition of these items, but then there might be that cultural aspect where they talk about war and drugs, and so you think about people being, you know, police officers being more aggressive because they have body armor, they have higher caliber weapons, that they're going to become more aggressive. And it's one, again, one of those things where there might be a relationship, but we can't say for certain. And when I was doing this research, a lot of it, What's interesting about doing research on police militarization and police behavior is that we have these stories, unfortunately, every day about police violence. And I was just thinking about the story of Daniel Shaver, 
the young man from Mesa um, who was shot by an uh, officer in a hotel room and they had body camera video and that officer had an AR-15 which is a military style weapon and he had body armor and you could just see in that video how aggressive how almost that the officer wanted to kill him and in that video and so you know it's, you know I look at my research I do my research I get academic but there's also the story part of it the anecdote part that I try to tie together and so it's one of those things where you have to believe that you know this is what my research says says but then you look at the video it's like that kind of fits within that so it's possible that you know this increased militarization has led to more aggressive behavior, which then in turn leads to both excessive use of force and lethal use of force. First, just to have people realize these impacts. So there's discussions of police militarization, but only in terms of what it does for crime. Does it lower crime, does it increase crime? Well, that's a very important question, it's not the only question we need to ask. We need to ask about basically the social cost of militarization so that we understand, okay, if it lowers crime, at what cost? Are we willing to bear that cost? And so what I'm hoping with my research to be able to say, okay, these are some of the other impacts of militarization, and we need to take that into account when we talk about militarization, when we talk about police behavior. And so one thing I'm hoping for is to have kind of a discussion of, you know, we have these items, it's available at little cost, but what is it doing to our officers? What's, what is it doing to officers, uh, the relationship between police and citizens? And is that kind of what we want? And so I'm hoping in terms of policy is for officers, for communities to be able to work together and say, yes, we want to lower crime. Public safety is number one. Whenever we talk about police behavior, public safety is number one. But the question is, how are we getting to that? What's the road that we're taking? What's the path? What's the process? And is militarization helping that or hurting that? And so if we can get an understanding of the impacts, the full impacts of militarization, then we can have a good discussion about how do we make police community interactions positive. Economics is wonderful. Economics, the way to think about economics is that a toolkit, that it gives you all these tools to be able to answer questions. And at the end of the day, economics is about answering questions and understanding, you know, the full impact, both benefit and cost. And so one of the problems with e economists is that we look at things very broadly, but we're not able to translate that in a, in a way that people will be able to listen. So we take, you know, when we talk about police militarization, everyone says, oh, it's terrible, we gotta get rid of it. My aspect as an economist is that I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. The research will tell me what the answer to that question is. So it may be that, okay, that has an impact, that has a negative impact in terms of use of force, but then it might be a positive impact in terms of crime. So instead of looking at one aspect and saying, yes, you know, we should get rid of it because it causes police violence, or no, it lowers crime, so we need to do it. It's like, no, let's take both of it together. And so as an economist, you're able to you know, provide, I think, the best answers to important questions. And so for a student, that's if you, want, if you want to impact the world, economics is the best path to do it. So new economic thinking is very important is because for the longest time, we've had a narrow viewpoint of how to do economics. Now, we've had alternative theories and alternative frameworks, but it's never been accepted in the mainstream. And so the problem with that is that it limits the, how we can answer questions. It limits what the questions, or let, limits what the answers to those questions are going to be. And so with new economic thinking, it can provide different answers. And so broader, and what's, and what's helpful with new economic thinking is that a lot of reasons why we had a narrow focus is because of people who became economists were from a very narrow group. As we broaden the base of who could become an economist, we could be able to broaden new economic thinking and therefore come up with different answers and kind of better, richer, more robust answers to society's problems.